so with that, uh, Dr. Shabtai Bittman will get started, and we appreciate you coming so much. Uh, thanks, Nicole, and thanks for the warning about the phone. I've had it yeah. ringing in the middle of my talks. <laughs> <laughs> Just hang on a sec, okay? <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I appreciate the, the invitation, and it's, uh, it's great to be here. Um, uh, Nicole asked me to uh, kind of uh, use this opportunity to acquaint you with the book that we uh, just uh, published called Tool Forages. And uh, on the subject of uh, forage management, there's, there's a lot of articles in there, and uh, um, they're actually from all over the world. And on a variety of subjects, some of them relate uh, directly, and some of them re relate in a general sense, and some of them don't relate at all to the kind of issues that we have here. Uh, it's a collection of articles that represent a lot of the current thinking out there around the world in forages. And one of the reasons for wanting to put out this book is just to make people aware that forages are interesting because forages have to compete for funding with, with a lot of uh, more sexy crops. And they always get left behind. And people think there's not a lot going on. But in fact, there is a lot going on in forages, and one might even say there's more going on in forages right now in research than there is in, in some of the other fields. It's a lot, a lot of really exciting work. So what I've decided to do was really to uh, take you through a few different articles, so a couple of them we wrote, and there's a couple that some other people have written, and uh, just a selection, and sort of guide you through some thinking. Um, we're not going to try to cover all the 40 some odd chapters or anything like that. So. I always kind of like to start with, uh, with, a, with, a, a, with, a, with a slide or with, with an idea that, that needs to always be there as part of what we're doing, and that is that we're always dealing with, uh, with a system, and uh, even when we talk about a part of the system, we have to think about the system as a whole, not just that part of the system we're talking about. So this is a, just a, a kind of a phosphorus budget, could be a nitrogen budget, something along the same line, and this is on the dairy farm, and we've got concentrates coming in and bringing in nutrients and fertilizer, <coughs> and then we have the output, and you, you know all this very well. Um, so in, in this talk, we're going to be talking about forage production. Of course, the idea is to reduce the amount of, of uh, concentrates and, and roughages that you need to bring in, and also to reduce the amount of fertilizer. So, so that's, if you can do all that, then you will improve the balance, So, uh, and that's always uh, something to keep in mind. The things that you do need to improve the system as a whole. If they just improve a part of the system, it may or may not be beneficial. So, uh, just to hi uh, highlight that point, uh, I'll show you this uh, slide, which uh, if, if you've heard my talks, you may have heard me mention this before, but it, it's worth repeating, and it's actually mentioned in, uh, or shown this on chapter 25. So what, what this is, is it's a dairy farm in the Netherlands. And what they were able to do in the 90s is uh, quantify all the flows of nitrogen through that farm. Okay, So e everything that you can think of in terms of internal flows, where the manure goes, where the feed goes through the animal, through the manure, and all the different loss pathways into the environment, whether it's as ammonia from barns or storages or denitrification you see, uh, you see here. I mean, I, I, I won't go through all this. But there, there was a really interesting story that goes with this, with this uh, study, and that is that uh, uh, when they, they, they always try to improve their um, sustainability of their operation. I mean, that, that, they're really, there's a lot of pressure to do that in, in, in Europe and especially in the Netherlands. And uh, so they tried different things and uh, a bunch of different things. But the thing that worked, that, that had the biggest effect, was the thing you would not have expected. And that was when they switched a lot of their corn field, a lot of their grass field to corn. So corn is always sus suspected of being kind of a leaky crop, and uh, you know the roots are not that good, and the land is bare half the year, and, and all this kind of stuff. And grasses are, are not that way. They're way more they're, they're way more protective of the environment in so many ways. But that's not what happened in this study. What happened was that when they took about half of their grassland and put into corn. Corn was relatively new there because they, they were kind of on the margin in terms of heat units, but the varieties have improved and suddenly they could grow it. So, so then the, why, would, why would corn be an advantage for them? And the reason is that by growing corn, they could uh, improve the overall feed balance that they were feeding to the animals. And uh, so if you could 
get, produce the feed that the animals need more closely, then you won't have those surpluses. Like with the grass, they had too much degradable protein. And so they had a lot of protein in the manure, and they could reduce that by growing corn. I mean, we grow corn, we know that. But the lesson here was that you couldn't really predict that by looking at corn and grass. You had to look at corn and grass, not corn or grass. So you had to look at the whole system, and only by looking at the whole system uh, could you actually uh, determine that a less protector, less environmental crop would actually be more environmental in that system. So anyway, that's just uh, by way of background. It's not really what the talk is about. Uh, the talk is about the book, Cool Forages. And I have to, uh, of course, uh, Derek Hunt, uh, my colleague for many, many years and co-author here, so I wanted to recognize him. Uh, the picture, in case you're wondering, it was uh, uh, a young woman uh, about uh, 19 years old on, a, on an art scholarship in, in Sweden. And her background is, uh, <coughs> she's partly Canadian. She was born in Canada. She's living in Germany. Her mother is Russian. Her father was Canadian. Anyway, uh, it's uh, kind of a hodgepodge, but I, I, I saw some of her work. I thought it was really neat, and she came in a nice picture. So this is a typical grass plant. You, you know this. Uh, you usually don't want it to get this far along, but you have uh, the inflorescence here. You have the leaves. You have the sheath. You have the nodes, and uh, going under stem. And then, of course, you have the roots. But when you start the season, you start with, a, with something that looks like that. So, so the question is, how do you get from that to that, and how does the grass grow? And so that's the chapter, How Grasses Grow. And the secret is in the growing point. And the growing point of a grass is an amazing thing that people have forgotten about. I mean, nobody's talking about this anymore. You, you, you just don't see it. Even if you look it up and you look for this kind of picture, this is uh, 50 years old. Anyone can take this picture, but no one's doing it anymore. So it's kind of a lost art. So, um, but I think you need to understand, it, it helps to understand what, what's going on. So this is a huge enlargement of, a, of the growing point in each of the tillers that's in that, you know, when they're that tall. Each tiller has one of these uh, growing points in it. And these are the leaves that are starting to form, okay? And these are the, um, the growing regions in this overall uh, meristem, which is a growing region in the plant. Okay, so um, when the, when the uh, uh, grass grows early on in the season, then these uh, leaves will form one after the other, and the ones inside will form. Okay, and uh, so you get a bunch more leaves formed. Okay, and they and they all come from the bottom, and then something happens, and it it all changes. So there's a trigger that causes uh, this growing point to change from what this looks like with, with a bunch of leaves coming out of it to uh, a situation where now these areas in between will start to elongate. And so when they elongate, and then, it, then that's when the stem grows. And it grows because of each of these little areas here begins to elongate. Okay? And then the leaves will still be coming out from here. But there's another thing that happens at the same time. And that's triggered, by the way, by day length, okay? Not just by day length, I'll talk more about it, but in, this, in the spring, it's triggered by day length, and it depends on the species and the variety, exactly what the day length is. Temperature has some effect on it, too. So the other thing is that you get, I don't have a picture of it here, but instead of one kind of ridge here, you get a kind of a doubling up of the ridges. And when that happens, those doubling up, those ridges in the top of the plant that are doubled up, they become the inflorescence of the plant. So you get the elongation, and then the leaves are kind of far apart because these regions here have started to grow. So, and then that lifts the leaves. And then the, the bottom of the sheath, or the, the, the bottom of the sheaths and the bottom of the leaves, the leaves will grow from here, and the, the sheaths will grow from the bottom, and then they elongate, and they partly keep up with the elongating stem. And this still grows from here, but there's a change, a double ridging effect and then that will produce the inflorescence. And that's how you get, that's how grasses grow. So what controls um, the, uh, the switch in development is day length, but it's not, it's not only that. Um, 
Yeah. So what? So you can see that there's uh, there's an effect of variety. These so these are this is broom, uh, smooth brown grass, but uh, it's true for orchard grass or other grasses. So what you see is a mix of population. Um, the maturity is the same, but here you have a whole lot of flowering, and here you have only a few that are flowering, and here you have only a few that are flowering. It's a, it's a varietal difference. And so what's with the other tillers? Well, the other tillers never went into that double ridging. They just will keep producing leaves from that growing point, and even as the plants get taller, and a lot of people don't notice that those tillers are in, in, in the field, and they're there, and, you, and they think, well, they'll keep producing, they're, they're just late, and they'll produce these inflorescences. They won't. They won't ever produce it. They'll just produce more and more leaves, and the leaves will be smaller and smaller. So, so variety has an effect, but um, there's the age of stand. So as the stand gets older, there tends to be less flowering. Uh, fertility is important, but it's not really fertility in the spring. That'll tell you how big the tillers are, but it won't tell you how many are flowering. That's mainly in the fall. So if it's very fertile in the fall, then uh, early enough in the fall, then that will cause more flowering in the spring. And how does that work? It works like this. So those buds that form in the fall have to get a, a cold treatment. They have to go through winter. So the more buds you have in the fall, the more, um, uh, the more that will get that cold treatment and they'll flower. And if they come later, if the far buds only form in the spring, because let's say it was very infertile in fall, and then you just fertilize, so you'll get, but those won't, won't flower. Um, so you need that vernalization, that vernalization or cold treatment has to happen in, in, in the winter time. But there are exceptions. And the two notable ex exceptions uh, for common grasses are perennial ryegrass and timothy. Amongst the cool grasses, is perennial ryegrass and timothy. And so if you cut perennial ryegrass, this, the, the regrowth will form <coughs> inflorescence. It, it will be reproductive, form, eventually form seed, if there's enough time. But if you cut orchard grass or tall fest, you won't do that. Occasionally, you'll see one or two, or, you know, a small number of uh, tillers that will have a seed head. Those escaped. They just didn't, they got, they were still short. And so they, uh, you know, if you cut it a bit later, you won't see that they cut early. You're going to miss a few, they, they escape it. Um, but if you cut perennial ryegrass, it'll keep flowering. Okay, town mm -hmm. ryegrass will keep flowering. Timothy uh, will keep flowering. But most of the other grasses will not. So uh, the, the curious thing about these tillers is that um, <coughs> they have a very different um, proportion of leaves. So here's two varieties uh, that actually from the same picture as before, the signal and rebound. Rebound is one of those without many seed heads and it has a lot of seed heads. And uh, so this is a chapter 38 about tillers maturity and forage quality. And you can see the proportion of floral tillers, the ones with the seed heads, is higher with, with this variety than that variety. And what is the difference is that uh, the leaf proportion Okay, in the non-floral tillers, it's the same. In the floral tillers, it tends to be a little bit better uh, in, the, in, in uh, the, the rebound variety. But in the entire herbage, is way more leaves in the southern variety that doesn't go floral. It doesn't produce as many seeds. The seed industry doesn't like it that much necessarily. But it's got way more leaves in total because it's got a way higher proportion of the non-flowering or a lower proportion of of the flowering tillers. So we know that when these tillers, we don't allow them, we don't like them uh, for dairy farmers, it'd be farmers are different, but the dairy farmers, we don't, we don't want that quality to decline, we don't want the plants to advance very far uh, because they, the quality will decline. We know that maturity uh, is, a, is a huge influence on forage quality. Um, so we're still here on chapter uh, 38 uh, about tillers and charity for shot. And this is what this shows. So this is crude protein, and uh, the quality declines over time, as you would expect. And uh, so what we've looked at here is the effect of drought. And you know, when, it, when there's drought, the plants, uh, you know, the leaves start to die off and, and this kind of thing, and uh, first wilt a little bit and then die off. So when you have drought, the quality actually declines more rapidly in terms of protein. Protein goes down more rapidly. Okay, so we have drought, the protein goes down, the plants look like egg, and so on. But, 
the digestibility actually goes down less fast. So uh, here you see the red is the drought. You can see the, it, it goes down, but it doesn't go near as down as the well watered. So when you have, when you have the drought, then you, you have better quality, although the plants, in terms of digestibility, better plants, although the plants look like heck. And th the reason why I think this is important is that most of what we know about forage quality is told to us by animal scientists. And they do the work on uh, different methods of testing and feeding and all this stuff and turning it into milk. And these animal scientists actually don't know that much about plants. They know a lot about animals. But don't. So when they compare material for quality, they usually check it over maturity. And if you just look at maturity, protein and digestibility, they follow the same pattern. They both go down as the plants mature. But the processes are completely different. And sometimes that's really important. Uh, if you're an animal scientist and all you want to show is that, well, it's mature and, it's, and here's the test and this is how you're supposed to feed your, your animal. But if you're trying to manage the crop, it helps to know what controls that quality. So what happens, so what this shows is here, when the quality goes down, the protein, the, the, the plants are stressed. And so, and the leaves tend to senesce, they get older and so on. So what the plant will do is it'll pump the nitrogen, whatever it can, back into the roots. Okay, so what's left above the ground has less protein. So if you have that stress, you don't only have the effect of the aging, but then you also have the effect of that translocation of that nitrogen back into the plant, into the lower part of the plant that you're not harvesting. And so uh, those senescent leaves have lower protein. But it's quite different when it comes to digestibility because digestibility is controlled by soluble carbohydrates, digestible carbohydrates, and the absence, let's say, of lignin. Or, so the less lignin you have. So when the conditions are good, more lignin will form. And when more lignin is formed, that's over here, more lignin is formed, that ties up more of the carbohydrates, and that makes the plant less digestible. When you have drought, first thing that happens is that lignin synthesis shuts down. And the growth stops. So that plant starts to accumulate sugars because the stomat is still, the, the openings, is, the pores are still open, and the plant will, as an adaptive feature, will accumulate more sugar. So even though the plant looks like crap, it actually gets good feed out of it, uh, but not protein. Get good digestibility, probably better than you would have with the well water plant, although it looks terrible, and although the protein is lower. And that's the story that the animal people will never tell you because they don't know that. Um, only a few will, will know that. So it, it's kind of helpful. So there are other things that affect this uh, soluble carbohydrates, and we know that that's really important for feeding. And now we're talking a little bit more about dairy systems here. This is, uh, uh, there's a couple of chapters. Uh, this is chapter 43 uh, by Belanger, and there's actually chapter 42 uh, by, Ber by uh, uh, Bertholm, and uh, I'll get to that. And it's on the subject of <coughs> morning versus afternoon harvesting, which is really big in eastern, getting to be really big in eastern part of the country. And there has been some research in the U.S. on this. Hank Malin years ago has worked on this. Um, in, uh, actually, I don't know where he was, but somewhere in the central U.S. Um, so what you see is here, this is uh, time after uh, sunrise, the number of hours after sunrise. And you see that if you monitor the non-structural carbohydrate or the soluble carbohydrates or the starch, it goes up and it kind of reaches a peak after noon, in, in, in noon. So if you harvest about here, then you'll be picking up more. And it's not trivial. The amounts are not trivial, see. And uh, that, that one, uh, I think, was just uh, alfalfa. This is the difference between different, different grasses. OK, they uh, don't grow orchard grass there, so that's not in there. But the, the trend will be the same. Um, but they do have tall fescue in here. There's one with less, but I think they really struggle with tall fescue. It's not very well adapted, and the varieties are different from the ones we grow here. Um, but you get this, you see that it's pretty well universal across all. So if you, if you harvest early in the morning, you'll get less of that non-structural, very digestible carbohydrates in the forage. So what they did was they looked at what happens over time when you put it in a swath. Okay, so that you do this experiment, you take it in the lab, and it's all well and good, but what happens in the field? 
So here they have, uh, they, this is actually samples taken from field cutting. So um, the uh, AM is the, is the red, okay, and the PM is the blue. So harvested in, at the AM or PM. So this is harvested in the evening, uh, the night of the day before, and this is harvested the next morning, okay. And what they showed is that even by cutting in the evening of the day before, when it came down to day two, they still had more, uh, more carbohydrates, more, more of this uh, non-structural carbohydrates, which is the energy, a lot of the energy that the cows like and also the bugs that make the silage like. And this is true whether you, uh, whether you swath, which is the dotted line, or you don't swath. And of course we do swath. And so, um, uh, so that, it shows that, that that holds up. This shows the moisture content, so everything's drying up about right about the same rate. Didn't make much difference, but by harvesting the day before, when it's uh, when it takes the advantage of the of the sunshine that took, that that that, uh, that the plants had that uh, in that previous day, that would be essentially burned <coughs> overnight uh, by respiration. So uh, that gives you an opportunity to explain something mm -hmm. about why we call the book "Cool Forages," because forages are cool but also because the book is about cool forages, in other words, cool season forages or tempered forages. And so um, most of the grasses we use here are tempered, cool season forages, uh, orchard grass, perennial rye, uh, timothy, or um, uh, tall fescue, meadow fescue, and it's all, these are all, what isn't is corn, for example, is, is a warm season. Uh, it's not a cool, it's a, it's a warm. And uh, that's an annual, but there's also many perennial warm season grasses. Uh, many of the ornamental grasses that we use are, uh, happen to be warm season grasses. Uh, sorghum is a warm season grass. So what are the differences? The, these cool and warm, that's very basic photosynthetic differences. And uh, what happens in a warm season grasses is they don't, res they don't have dark respiration. So they kind of like, they don't breathe at night. They just don't, it's the way it works. Uh, so they don't burn off this carbohydrate, and so if you have very warm nights, it's really advantageous to not burn off your carbohydrates that you collected during the day, and they have a way to avoid doing that. But the cool season grasses, they'll burn off at night, but usually where they grow, the nights are a bit cooler, so it's not as detrimental. They have other advantages to do better in cool weather, uh, but that's the difference. So, so there is loss of carbohydrates over the night, which would not happen uh, so much with corn. Okay, so it's not an advantage for corn to have a cool night, but it is an advantage for a cool season grass to have a cool night. Too cold, but to, to be cool. If it's a very warm night, it doesn't do quite as well. So that's why we like warm nights for corn. It's not something we usually get here, but that's a whole other story. So here's another, uh, this is now uh, the article by Bertiome, and Belanger, the, the previous guy, he's a, uh, he, he's a, uh, forage guy like myself. This guy is an animal nutritionist, and uh, so he wouldn't know what I just told you before about the, uh, the, the effect of drought. Um, oh, he's a pretty good guy though. So, uh, so starch, uh, water soluble, it's all higher, you know, uh, like just like I showed you before, it's a different experiment, um, and uh, I believe this is also with, uh, with alfalfa. So now he's, what he's showing here in this article, uh, chapter 42. It's, uh, these are different studies that were done. These aren't his studies, these are other people's studies. And, it, and he wants to see the effect on, on the animal of having somewhat more or less non-structural carbohydrates. So here's 4.2 versus 3, 7.7 .7 versus 6, 16.5 versus 12.6, whatever, 24 and 16. So different in different ranges, but they all these have uh, kind of groups forage with higher and lower. So <clears throat> mostly, not in every case, but mostly when you have higher non-soluble carbohydrates, you also have higher dry matter intake, that's DMI, higher dry matter intake. So here, here, and here, but not here, okay? You also tend to have um, higher milk production. So here you had higher milk production, and here you had higher, and here you had higher milk production, but not here. And then this is milk urea nitro uh, nitrogen, and in all cases here, um, 
you had less, we know we want less mercury and nitrogen, of course. It's an indication of poor utilization of nitrogen. So one of the things that we do see definitely consistently all the time is when you have more, no, more non-structural carbohydrate or sugars, let's say, um, then, uh, then uh, you get better use, of, uh, better use of the nitrogen in the plant and probably less excretion of nitrogen in the manure. And that's usually fairly, it's not a perfect indicator, but it's a pretty good indicator, uh, MUN, that there we have uh, nitrogen. So, um, so that's the, uh, the benefit uh, of, of the, there's another point I was going to make, but okay, I'll try to do it. So now this is a comparison, this is his work, uh, and it's the effect of uh, morning versus afternoon harvest. This is dry matter intake, and we want the cows to eat more. So sure enough, they do when you harvest in the afternoon. They milk more, and they have less milk, urea, nitrogen. And again, we're still on uh, chapter 42. And uh, just another little thing that they found, because they're nutritionists and they like to do this kind of thing. So they monitored the rumen pH, and what they found was that they had better, it didn't get quite as acidic, and that's beneficial uh, for, from a cow health standpoint, when they had the PM harvest. Okay, so, so you had uh, better degradation. So, oh yeah, I was going to say, so uh, non-structural carbohydrate, what is a structural carbohydrate? That's cellulose. Okay, so cellulose is a carbohydrate. It's part of the structure of the plant, so it's a structural carbohydrate. But if you have starch, if you have sugars in any of their forms, those don't contribute to the structure of the plant. They're carbohydrates, and they usually degrade much faster. They digest much faster and more completely. So now we're going to change uh, course a little bit. And this is uh, some of our work, uh, chapter 25, how to improve nutrient deficiency on old dairy farms. And so what we're showing here um, is a comparison between growing early, medium, and late maturing grasses. And that's an option, this orchard grass. This is own work that I can see. Okay, and, uh, dry, and, and we're looking at what are the implications of choosing early, medium, and late variety. And we're going to compare five grant system, and in a second you'll see the three, a possible three cut system. Okay, and we're going to look at yield, and we're going to look at quality, and we're going to try to look at what it all means. So, if you um, use a late, if, if you cut three times as opposed to five times, you'll get higher yields. This is over three years we did this. We're quite sure the data would apply. So, by cutting five times, we're actually reducing our production. And why is that? Because the plants have a growth curve, and when we're cutting five times, we're not allowing the grasses to grow to their maximum growth rate on a land area basis. Just before they're about to do that, we cut them. And then also we don't allow the regrowth to do as well because they don't replenish the roots as well, or, you know, so then they have to start from scratch. So the reason is it's quality, and you'll see in a minute, but in terms of, qual in, in terms of quantity, there's a benefit to doing three cuts. Okay, and the three cuts would be in, in what we did was around the 20th of May, give or take, and then uh, middle of July, and then kind of an end of season cut, three cuts. This is a total of the three cuts. Okay, so we find, so, okay, so this is, this is what the farmer would do, typically in our area, I think, grow an early variety of orchard grass and cut it five times. That's pretty well what's being done. What we're proposing is, maybe, is to use a late variety and cut it only three times, okay? So that's what, we're, that's what's what the experiment was uh, uh, intended to find out. And you can see that you definitely get um, almost a couple of times more yield and you have less work to do, right? But, of course, you take a hit a little bit in the quality. Okay. And we know that, and that's why people aren't doing it. Uh, that's why this has bec become the normal practice. So this is uh, NDF, <coughs> neutral detergent fiber. And this is a three-cut system, and this is the five-cut system. And we don't want a lot of NDF because that's the structural, mostly the structural. It's also structural and non-structural carbohydrate. But um, usually uh, more digestible would have lower NDF. But the NDF digestibility hasn't actually gone down. It's just a, off by a hair. So if you look at the three cut here, 
it's really, really close in terms of what the NDF digestibility is. So although we have less NDF, what NDF we have is really quite digestible. And if we look at uh, the yield of digestible dry matter, so uh, that's in a way what you want. All else being equal, it's not, but we'll get to that. So uh, the current practice, and you can actually bump up the total yield of digestible material by the three-cut system if you use a late variety. And notice how the trend is opposite. So if you're going in a three-cut system, everything seems to be better with the late variety. And if you're going with a five-cut system, everything is better with the, it always seems to be better with the early variety. Protein. Um, it's down. There's no question about it. I, that wouldn't surprise you. Uh, you're, the, the plant's less mature. You're down around 13% crude protein, about 15% here, according to the kind of management. We didn't overdo the fertilizer or manure. Uh, but in terms of prote protein yield, it's not so clear cut, actually. Um, because of the higher yield, you get slightly less protein yield. But the protein seems to be a bit of a, a tough nut. So if you look at it, uh, um, we'll go, I mean, this is basically a summary of the previous table of, in terms of quality. But what I will show you now is, so how does this affect the farm as a whole? Okay, so you got more yield, but the quality is down a bit. So we thought, well, really, we're not growing grass <laughs> for digestibility. We're growing it for fiber because we can grow more corn, and we get lots of digestible nutrients from corn. And a lot of the ideas about using the grass came from a time when people were not so comfortable with corn because the corn varieties weren't as good, the technology wasn't as good, the planters weren't as good, the sidebanders weren't as good, the weed control, you know, there's all kinds of issues that happen with corn which are more or less all being resolved. And so corn's really good now and there's a lot more of it being produced. So do we really need the grass to give us the digestible nutrients and, or, or should we look for more yield and more of the roughage? And I, one of the reasons I came to this idea was I discovered through one of the commercial nutritionists is that a lot of our farmers are bringing in straw from Oregon, from the seed industry there, to feed the cows, not for bedding, but to feed. And I'm thinking like, whoa, we can produce roughage. We're doing everything to not produce roughage. Why are we doing that? We can increase our yield. So what we did was we did a, a kind of a, a calculation using a, a model uh, one of our nutritionist colleagues, uh, Mary Lou Swift, who used to work with industry here. And I will jump this and just go to this one. And what we did was, so this is the five cut and this is the three cut uh, system with the early and the late. And so what she did was she said, okay, so how do we balance the ration? So we balance the ration by having this orchard grass silage here, but now we don't need as much because uh, it's, it's it, it has more fiber, so she cut back on this and made that up with more corn silage. And then the grains, actually she was able to keep the same grain mix, but notice this little star we'll get to in a sec, okay? It's important. And then um, she was looking for a ration with a crude protein of about 14%. I, some people have said that's a bit low, but the important thing is a comparison here. And then the meta metabolizable, allowable milk, I mean, overall, uh, she, it was maintained. So we, we could produce the same. Uh, the asterisk is because we needed to add more protein to the feed. So the protein we couldn't, the energy you could make up with the corn, you couldn't make up the protein with the corn uh, because corn is low protein. So you could fix everything by growing more corn, har harvesting grass later, and, but you still need to have a little bit more protein in the feed. So the conclusions are this, that if you use a three-cut system with a late variety, you can increase your yield by 15% on your grass, which means, and also, you're only harvesting three times. Your first harvest is later, which probably means you have better weather, and uh, you have more time to plant your corn, because it usually it won't clash as much. And... Uh, but on the other hand, you'll get a huge swath at first cut. It'll be looser, it'll tend to dry better, you'll have more eggs in that basket, that's a bit of a negative. So if, the, if you happen to hit really bad weather at that time, it may actually be worse, and it'll take you longer to harvest that, that bigger ball. So 
the increase in yield and the lower feeding of the grass means you don't need as much grass acres because you have more yield and because you're not feeding as much, then you got more room for corn. And we find that corn yields at least 25% at least 25 more than grass does. So that land can now produce 25% more. Uh, and, that, and you have the opportunity of maybe using a relay crop or a cover crop. So it's possible, and, and this, we haven't tested this, but the idea here is that it's possible to think of the whole farm and to come up with a strategy for how to allocate your land and how to harvest your different crops and how to make best use in order to maximize your home feed and so that you don't necessarily you'll buy less and also have less waste, uh, which is always a problem, so you have less excretion, less waste. And so when we develop these strategies, we should consider the whole farm. And in my opinion, this has actually never been done. There's no one actually that's ever done that. Because who's, who would do it? The, the nutritionists working for the companies, I, I, they're not ill-meaning, I would say, but they have a focus, which is, this is what you've got for feed? OK, so this is what I'm going to supply you. And I wouldn't necessarily go out of my way to figure out a way that I might sell you less. You know, maybe I will tell you if I think of it, but I'm not going to really go out of my way to do that. So, and the forage people, they can't really come up with that because they don't know how to balance the ration. And there isn't enough communication between the forage people and the animal people. For example, we don't have a nutritionist working in BC right now, other than for the private companies. We used to, we don't. And I haven't for quite a few years, and there's no prospect really of one coming here. You guys have Joe Harrison, who comes and speaks to you. But you don't really have a forge person here. You know, so, and, and this is everywhere the same. You know, you, it's only a few places, like in Quebec, they, they really have a good team. And there's a few places where they really got good teams. A lot of places, it's either one or the other. And so we should think of a more integrated approach to making some of these decisions. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is uh, a bit different. But it's a, a really neat article. And it's something quite new. And it's uh, out of Quebec again, um, where they have a very large team working on forage crops. Uh, they have about, just in one center, they have about 10 people covering the same areas that I cover. Um, so you can imagine how much they can accomplish, and they're really good people. So uh, Bertillon was one of them, and uh, Belanger, and, and yet another one is Martin Champigny. What they uh, were looking at is, so when you do nitrogen budgets, there's always this thing called a missing nitrogen. So you do your budget, and you estimate everything where it goes here and there and everywhere. You try to measure it, and you're always left with some that you can't account for. And what they're saying is, and what they've discovered with a lot of studies, is that there's a lot of losses that take place in the winter time. Now, the winter there is not like the winter here. The winter there is like, it looks like this. This is the temperature. I don't know if you can see it from the back. But uh, this is zero. Okay, the red line is zero. Make it easy. And anything that's below the red line is below zero. And it goes a lot below zero. Like it goes to minus 20 here, minus 30, you know, minus 20 and 30 here. Uh, this is a, a nice year. They only went down to minus 20 here. You know, so they get some, and they also get snow. Lots and lots of snow. So, um, <coughs> snow here. Yeah, well, this is precipitation, so you see a lot of wintertime precipitation. That would all be, that would all be in, in the form of snow, of course. <coughs> so, what they found was that there's a lot of leaching that takes place in frozen soils. And that was, so when the soils are frozen, they discovered actually they're not frozen. So you think they're frozen, but they're not frozen. But that depends on the soil type. So if you have a sandy soil, if it's frozen, it really is frozen and nothing happens. But if you have a clay soil with a lot of organic matter, then the soil particles will, will um, reorient the water molecules. They won't allow them to form that crystalline structure and that will keep the water liquid even well below zero, kind of like an antifreeze. So that means that the, the water is available for biological activity. And so what they're seeing here, this is nitrate leaching. And so what I did was I drew a line where the peaks were at, at winter after winter. And you can see these are the leaching events. Okay, so that's where they are. Okay, I just drew these lines to connect it, to make it easier to see. And again, this is chapter 21. Okay. And by the way, this particular study here is from Finland, okay, which has similar climate. So 
So this one, I believe, is from Finland. And I'll show you some other data. So here, where you have a lot of leaching, you can see that they haven't even gone above zero. Maybe just a tad here, but and you know nothing is thawed, and they get this huge leach, well, significant leaching event. Here you have a significant. It's just barely starting to go above zero in terms of air temperature. And say this is just when it's starting to freeze, and then at the end. So you have these events, and basically nothing, if it's thawed is, well, I mean, you're still under snow. I mean, nothing is thawed. It's nothing is thawed at that time. So that's for leaching. Uh, this is nitrous oxide emission. So this is definitely mediated by bacteria. And uh, you can see this is, so this is data actually from Quebec. A liquid pigment urine in control. You can see where the control is not too much of this nitrous oxide. You know nitrous oxide is a greenhouse gas. And it, it represents a loss of nitrogen and, and an indicator. It's not a big loss in itself, but it's an indicator and that's also detrimental. So here we see that uh, they got these peaks not in, in February and in January and in March. And it's absolutely, here's a snow depth. And they got these peaks when the snow is in depth, uh, soil temperature, snow, um, 80 centimeters of snow here, uh, let's say 40 centimeters of snow, a foot and a half of snow, a foot and a half of snow. They're getting emissions when they got a foot. And, and let me tell you, it, it just looks like winter. That's when they have their winter carnival, and they build all these ice sculptures, and, and the, it's so cold you can't even stand it. And that's when they're getting these emissions that, t that take place. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's on the heavier soil. You don't see that on the, on the lighter soil or the coarse texture soil. And this is uh, similar data uh, from Finland again, and uh, also finding that they had a, these peaks here that occurred when it's really quite cool. And uh, what's interesting is that they get uh, grass and clover, they get quite much bigger peaks than grass alone. So the clover, even though they didn't apply nitrogen fertilizer, because it breaks down over winter, then as soon as it thaws, then it becomes a nitrogen source. So, so that's my story for today. Uh, I guess it should be time for questions, uh, maybe. And uh, I took you through some of the chapters in the book. And I welcome you to read the rest of them if for interest or, or any other reason. Um, nice pictures. Afternoon mowing versus morning mowing, you will get more carbohydrates in the structural and non structural. More non structural. Okay. Yeah. Um, over the long term, are you robbing the root system by taking more in the harvest and less? Are you leaving less for the next crop for the, for the future crops? Uh, you, you would if. I mean, yeah, that's a good point. And theoretically, it's true. It's true. But it's only on one day. It's only, you're only depriving at one day is work. So in the grand picture, it's probably insignificant. It's just that you're managing to capture that resource strategically for what you need. Okay. So I think if you did that every single day, it would definitely be a factor. If every day you prevented that soluble carbohydrate from returning back into the plant. But um, a lot of it overnight will just get burned as respiration. Because it, even if the plant can't grow, it'll still respire. It, it's just physics, or physics and chemistry. So you have reactions, and they'll take place because they're there, and, uh, and they can't be stopped. So, so there, there are reasons why this nighttime respiration takes place, but it's, it's really minor compared to the strategic benefit to the cow of having the soluble carbohydrate. That's what they're finding. We've never done this, but that's what they've found over many years of research. And as I said, some work that's been done uh, by Hank Mill in, in the States uh, over 20 years ago with similar findings. Is that only if you cut it in the afternoon and then harvest it that same afternoon? What if you let it go overnight to get a better well tone? Well, that's, that's what that, uh, that's a good question, but that's what that very nice study that they did. See, so here is exactly what you're asking. So this is cut in the afternoon, and this is cut the next morning. 
the same field, you know, all replicated, everything done exactly the same. So uh, you're starting because it's uh, <coughs> basically what would have happened is that this carbohydrates would have gone from where it was here down to here. This, th this is the same as what that was. It's just that's the difference. So you had a field, and you let's say half of it you cut in uh, you cut in the afternoon, six o'clock, eighteen, so at six o'clock, and half of it you left. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. now you've left the goal, and it, the difference maintains into day two. <coughs> Okay, so this compared to that, and this compares to that. No, I was wondering though, if, if you cut it in the afternoon and then you wait till the next day to chop it and, and store it. Yeah, so at any time you can kind of draw where the line is. Okay, so if, if it's the next afternoon would be, let's say, 4 o'clock the next afternoon. So you'd get this comparison. Okay, so you can just kind of follow this anywhere along. And that's where you would you would see, and it, it just it's consistent all the way through. And it's not perfect; it goes up and down a little bit because of sampling error and stuff. But it's, it's pretty consistent. So whether you swath or you direct, so uh, it's there's always um, a percentage unit in terms of dry matter. It's quite quite a bit, and uh, it, and it does translate into in, into higher better performance of the cows. On, <clears throat> we, we cut five times, so on a three-cut harvest, how many days between cuttings? Well, I think the key thing is when you take the first cut. Right, but That's the first when's thing. your next cut? Right, so the next, oh. you know, the, and what would be the indicator of that? Um, uh, so we, we found that, like, you look for when the grass will stop growing, in effect. You know, if it's still growing, let it grow. Right. You know, and but you still want to leave enough time to get one more cut, so you don't want to leave it too late. Right. So, so a lot of a lot of us, we we have, you know we cut 28 days or whatever. Um, we have grass that's laying down, and if we wait longer, you think you're going to lose some. Laying down, it lodged. You mean? Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 So um, yeah, that that could be an issue. That uh, definitely could be an issue. Uh, it tends to be more of an issue for the first cut, I would mm -hmm. say. Uh, so you would definitely want to cut it before that would happen. Right. I mean, obviously, you know. Right. And that depends on how much nitrogen you're putting on, of course. Mm -hmm. So, so if it's really loaded down with nitrogen, then you have to make sure you catch it before. Right. Before. So I mean, it's not either. In any case, it's not a three or five cut, either or. These are right. the treatments. Right. Maybe some years it'll be more four cuts, you know, or something, but mm -hmm. the idea is to back off in the number of cuts. Mm -hmm. But of course you want to avoid lodging, that's, yeah. that's awful. Yeah. <laughs> you don't go there at all. <laughs> Even in our plots we don't like it. No. <laughs> how, did, how does that affect then, if you uh, apply manure to it every time after you cut it, if you only cut three times, you're only putting three applications on it, are you going to have a depression in nutrient? Uh, Availability for the plant. Well, I think you would put more nutrients for that first cut. That's that would be quite critical. We didn't manipulate that. That's something we want to do. But uh, so we we gave the same total amounts. Actually, we did apply a little bit more each cut because the same we use the same total amount of, of okay. nutrients and we use as mineral fertilizer, not as manure in our trial. Uh, but uh, yeah, you need to p put more each time for that next crop mm -hmm. because it's you want to supply it with sufficient nutrients. And also that will keep your protein up a little higher. So it's not something that we're recommending people rush out and do, but it's just something that one might consider experimenting with, you know, and seeing if there's, uh, and, and, the, and again, the reasoning is that no one has ever really, in my opinion, no one has ever really thought it through like, what is the best way to use? You got 100 acres. What is the best way to use 100 acres or 500 acres, whatever? Like, starting from scratch, what is the best way to use all that land? Now, I don't think there's enough thought that's gone into it. It's a very basic question, and especially since we don't have a lot of land. You know, so let's. What, and because also because corn has become so much more prominent, and we know we can get good growing corn crops. And I think 20 years ago we weren't quite so sure. Some bad corn years and people backed off, but 
not recently. What's a good parameter for cutting? You say afternoon, like starting time to quitting time. Say, say you mow till 10 at night. Is that. Oh, oh, when do you quit at we night? Start at, we start at about 11 o'clock in the morning. We have one mower to keep ahead of our chopper. We have to mow till 10 or 10 or 11. When would you stop? You yeah, mean? when would you stop? Well, I, I, I can't say for sure, but uh, let's go by here. And you can see that by, okay, so this is, uh, this is six, this is eight, and you're starting to get a drop. What, okay, so I guess the point is this. Once it starts to get dark, their days are a bit shorter than ours. Um, we're around 49, they're about 46, 46, so it's not that different, but a little bit shorter uh, in the summertime. So um, the point is, it's a light with the photosynthesis. So once the light drops off, then you get to a point where it's neutral. You get a little bit of light, so you get some respiration, some photosynthesis. It's a break even. Um, and then uh, it gets darker, and then you start to get to more decreasing amounts uh, or greater losses. So you want to minimize the, the dark hours. I think that would be the best way to look at it. Um, and I think that also will reduce the risk of nitrate toxicity. We don't seem to have an issue with that as much, but I think that's, that would help with that. Because having that energy during the day, so the conversion, so plants take up nitrate, they prefer, they could take up ammonium, depends on the species, but they prefer to take up nitrate. And then they take that nitrate and convert it to ammonium before they synthesize protein. So the conversion of nitrate to ammonium, it's called reduction, you have to take the oxygen atoms off, put hydrogen on. That takes up more than half of all the energy that a plant used to grow, that one single step. So um, if you are short of energy, because it's been very dark, not, not, not much sunlight, you get a lot of nitrogen, a lot of nitrate coming into the plant, then that's when you run into problems of not having enough energy to make that conversion. And it's especially important in grasses because in legumes, some of that conversion happens below the cutting height. So you get the accumulation taking place below the cutting heights, and, and so you don't get that nit same nitrate issue with, with legumes, even if you apply nitrogen uh, fertilizer. But with grasses, it takes place in the leaves, and so that's with the, that energy. And that's, it's a really interesting little tidbit that sometimes goes unnoticed, but that, it, it takes so much energy to reduce, take those oxygen off. So it's like the opposite of burning, oxidation, is so to unburn it, so to speak, and make ammonia it takes huge energy. And that's why it takes energy to make ammonia, to make fertilizer from gas and nitrogen gas in the atmosphere. It takes so much energy to do that, uh, that reduction step. So Any other questions for our speaker? Well, I uh, may have just a couple minutes, but I know Shad Pai's gonna um, be taken off, so if you want to grab him for an extra question here right at the end, um, you can probably do so. Otherwise, let's thank him for his time.